Good afternoon, everybody. I'll try to keep it relatively short so that you can all get to the coffee break. Um, so I will be talking about Haas's eagle. Uh, that's a giant eagle from New Zealand. Um, and New Zealand during the Pleistocene was really dominated by birds. You had moas ranging from about 20 kilos up to about 200 kilos. And there was Haas eagle, which hunted these eagles, including the really big ones. Um, Haas eagle, like I said, was really, really big. Um, it had a, um, a wingspan of about two and a half meters. It weighed around 15, maybe even 17 kilos. Um, judging by the relationship of wingspan and weight, it was likely a forest um, flyer because they have relatively short wings so that they can maneuver through the trees. Um, yeah, so it's the biggest um, predatory bird that ever roamed the earth. It's about 50% larger than currently um, the largest predatory bird. And um, it evolved from the little eagle rather um, than the wedge-tailed eagle. For a long time, people thought it evolved from the wedge-tailed eagle because it's quite big, but then molecular evidence told us otherwise. Um, and it went extinct quite recently, in about the um, 1400, 1500, um, shortly after the last Noah's went extinct because it didn't really have any food anymore. And that's basically our fault because we came to the island and then the Noah's went extinct. And then how's people went to? Um, so what I wanted to figure out was, um, or we, it's a large team actually, what we wanted to figure out is um, whether the cranial biomechanics were more eagle-like or more vulture-like, because um, there's been some discussion on whether this animal was actively hunting or whether it was scavenging, because its skull has some features that are quite similar to vultures, so people have proposed that it might simply have been a scavenger. Um, and I wanted to do that using finite elements analysis. And I did that on four different load cases. So um, there's a simple bite down, um, which is based just on the muscle forces themselves. And then there was a pull back motion, a lateral shake, and a dorsal ventral pull, which are all different ways in which the bird might have torn the meat off the carcasses. And the fine animal analysis, for those of you who are not familiar with it, I'll, I'll go through it quite quickly. What you do is you make CT scans, and um, then you make a model out of that, consisting of tiny little blocks. And you can use the computer program to apply forces to these models and then calculate the stresses and strains on these little blocks. And you can then pick that in color so that you can kind of interpret what you're looking at. Um, and then afterwards, what you might be able to do, and what I did in any case, is take certain landmarks on the skull um, and take the stresses or the strains, I took strains in this case, um, and do a PCA on that. So you kind of see which birds are more similar in terms of stresses and strains and which are more different from each other. Um, and I did that along um, the mid sagittal plane just the top of the skull, and I used 18 landmarks for that. Um, the materials I had were six skulls. I had the um, Haas eagle itself, obviously, and then I had um, three um, hunters. So I had um, Aquila, which is the wedge-tailed eagle, Haliester is the whistling kite, and Euratus is the um, Little eagle, which is actually the closest living relative of a uh, house eagle. And then I had two vultures, a new world and an old world vulture. So now when we look at the results, we'll start with a simple bite, which is basically just the muscle forces themselves and the skull and the mandible. Um, the red colors or even white colors means that there's a lot of strain on the skull in those places. And the blues and the greens mean that it, there's not a whole lot of strain going on there. And what we see is that Harpagornis, so Haas eagle, um, is actually quite similar to um, Aquila. 
um, and to HPPs as well. But um, the colors are a lot more greenish and a lot more bluish than those, even though the patterns are quite similar. So basically, the skull of Harpagornis was better adapted to this fighting down because it experienced less strain on the skull. Um, and then when we look at the, um, the PCAs, we see that Harpagornis plots uh, kind of in the middle of everything. It's kind of messy. It's not like the, the vultures are really separated from the hunters. So um, I did a normal PCA, which takes into account both the absolute values and the distribution of these values. And then I did a standardized PCA. Um, in which case you're really only looking at the relative distribution of stress and strain along the mid of the plane and not the absolute values. But in both cases, um, here it's basically a mess and here Harpagornis is different from the rest, but it's not really clustering with any of the other animals. Um, then we will look at a pulling back motion. Um, we see that Harpagornis is again quite similar to Aquila and to Vulture Gravis. They both have these kind of greenish colors in this general area, and AGPs as well has that. So there's more similarity with the vultures in terms of the pulling back motion. Um, and now when we look at the PCA, um, we see that indeed when you take into account everything, so a normal PCA, that at least on the first PC, um, sorry, that should have said Harpagornis. Harpagornis is quite similar to the two scavengers. Um, and when you standardize the PCA, it's still closest to the two, to the two scavengers. So it's, it's clear that Harpagornis, at least in terms of this movement, um, seems to have similar adaptations as excellent scavengers do. Um, then we look at the lateral shake. Um, we see a similar thing again. Harpagornis is most similar to kind of these three, mostly these two, really. Um, and um, when we look at the plot, we see again that um, in, when you do a normal PC, Harpagornis is very similar to one of the scavengers, that would be Vulture. Um, but when you standardize it, you see that actually the pattern of um, stray distributions along the skull is, oh, sorry, is more similar to the hunters. So depending on how you look at it, it has affinities with, um, with both um, groups of birds. Um, and then when we look at the dorsal ventral pool, um, Harpagornis has relatively much strain, just like a GPS and a bullet. Um, Euratus has hardly anything, there's really nothing going on in that skull. That skull is perfectly adapted to that movement, there's no strain whatsoever. Um, and when we look at the PCAs, we see that Harpagornis is, is um, similar, is, is close to one hunter and one scavenger, so one hunter and one scavenger. Um, but when you standardize the PCA, it becomes a little bit messy again and everybody is all over the place. So what I found basically is that there is not really a very clear distinction between the scavengers and the hunters in most cases. I can't really say, okay, when I have high PC values, um, it, it must have been a scavenger, or if I have um, a lot of blues in this area of the skull, it's a hunter. Um, it doesn't really work out that way. It appears that every species seems to have its own specific adaptations, and that makes it a bit tricky to really interpret what's going on with fossils. Um, there seems to be some allometry. Um, we see that Harpagornis tends to be similar with the larger birds. Um, so the two vultures and the wedge-tailed eagle are all three quite large, much larger than the other two hunting birds, Haliaster and Euratus. So there might be some allometry going on, even, even if we've tried to take care of that by using different muscle forces, you know, smaller muscle forces for smaller birds. We've tried to correct for that, but we might have not been completely successful. Um, and we see that in the, uh, the biting down, 
Um, Harper Gordy's is very similar to its closest living relative, so to the hummingbirds, and that's probably because its basal cranial structure is very similar, but we also see because it had more blues and greens that it was actually stronger than those animals, even though the basic structure was the same. Um, and it has additional adaptations similar to vultures, particularly for the pulling back. We saw that particularly in this movement, it was more similar to the vultures than any of the other movements. Um, and that's quite interesting because actually in modern birds, what we see is that vultures do tend to pull back, whereas um, Normal birds of prey, the hunters, they tend to pull up, so they have a dorsal ventral pull. They hardly ever pull back. So um, it's interesting that it's particularly this movement in which Harpagornis is, is similar to the vultures. Um, and so to conclude, Harpagornis is has a very strong bite, stronger than its relatives. Um, and it has certain similarities with vultures in terms of uh, cranial adaptations, and we think that that's possibly due to the size of the food source. Um, scavengers often have, a, you know, a buffalo guys, an elephant guys, they scavenge that, it's a lot larger than they are, whereas birds of prey tend to catch things that are catchable, and so relatively smaller to their own body size. And because um, has eagle, might have been hunting moas that were around 200 kilos and a lot larger than they were, this, this pulling back motion and this behavior might simply have to do with the size of the prey. And that would also explain why it has such a strong bite, because if it's catching things that are a lot stronger than he is, um, relative to other hunting birds, then it would make sense that it would need a much stronger bite. Um, even though most of the killing would take place with the talons, um, it still helps to have a strong beak when you're trying to tackle something that is more than 10 times as big as you are. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, uh, the main conclusion is based on these results, Harper is hunted rather than scavenged, um, but then the consumption of the food was more vulture-like due to the size of its prey. Um, and that was it. Thank you very much. You can all go have coffee now if you like. <laughs>